Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts, of George Mason University and Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, find other episodes, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is March 15th, 2011, and my guest is Gavin Andreessen, principal of the Bitcoin Currency Project. Gavin, welcome to Econ Talk. Hi, Russ. Great to talk to you. Well, I have to say, I, I get a lot of emails from listeners encouraging me to interview somebody or talk about some issue, and I think I've gotten more encouragement about Bitcoin than any other topic or person. So I think that's a good thing for Bitcoin. Uh, there's a lot of interest in the project, and what we're going to talk about today is what is Bitcoin and what are its prospects for the future. So let's start there. What is Bitcoin? Um, well, the short geeky answer is Bitcoin is the world's first distributed electronic currency. Um, if you're not a geek, some of those words probably don't make any sense to you. Um, the non-geeky short answer is that it is a new kind of money that we're using on the Internet. Are you a geek, Gavin? I have to clarify that to start with. I am a geek. Okay. I'm, a, uh, I'm a programming geek. Okay. So I may have to translate from time to time if you don't translate yourself. Okay. So the, non, the non-geeky, um, this is internet money. This is money available on the internet to use. Um, where does it come from? Um, well, that's the interesting thing, ap- thing about it. Um, unlike the money we, we typically think about, you know, dollars and euros and credit cards, that have a, uh, you know, kind of one central organization that creates it and controls it. Um, This is distributed, so it's people running Bitcoin software on their computer, and the people running the software are actually the people who generate the Bitcoins. So how does it work? Um, Well, from a user's perspective, you, you, you either sign up with an online Bitcoin service that Hold your bitcoins for you, or you download this software and uh, run it on your computer. And uh, the the software keeps track of the bitcoins that you own. Um, it gives you an interface to send bitcoins to other people, um, and also has an option if you download the software to try to generate bitcoins. So you can actually try to create money out of thin air, which is uh, you know, we can go into we'll go into much more technical detail maybe a little bit later on why that actually works. Right. So <clears throat> one of the, the challenges, of course, of any new currency is, is trust. So why don't you talk about the role that trust plays in currency generally and, ha- and what role it's, it's, it's playing in with Bitcoin? Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, trust is, if you really think about it, I mean, money is all about trust. You know, we trust, we trust our central bankers not to create money willy-nilly and have runaway inflation like they had in Zimbabwe. Um, you know, we trust that money is hard to counterfeit so that when we get a, a dollar bill from a, a merchant that, you know, we're not getting something that we take to the bank and then the bank just says, oh, no, that's not a real dollar bill, sorry. Um, so trust is huge, and uh, that's really, the I think, the biggest barrier for Bitcoin is to try to get ordinary, everyday people to start trusting it as opposed to people like me who are geeks. Um, Getting the geeks to trust it, I think, will be fairly easy because it's a uh, well, it's a currency and an open source project. So I've actually been been leading the open source project for the last month or two, and um, because it's open source, because anybody can you know look at what it's doing, uh, people can and have been um, looking at it in detail, figuring out exactly you know is it possible for somebody to steal your bitcoins. What are the different ways that maybe somebody could create bitcoins that don't follow the rules? Um, you know, all, all of these other things are, are hashed out completely in the open. Um, and so, in the last six months or so, really, um, you know, a lot of uh, geeks really have have looked at it and have become excited about it because so far nobody has been able to to uh, kind of poke holes in it. It seems to be a, a solid system that is trustworthy. So let's let's stop on that trust issue for another minute. If I take, um, <clears throat> let's say you're uh, a guest on my show. We don't pay, unfortunately, but let's say we did pay, and let's say we paid you $100. So if I give you $100 in cash, I could send you five $20 bills in the mail, which is a little bit nerve-wracking because they might get lost. Uh, 
Right. Or I could send you a check for $100, and that check would allow you to draw on my resources, my currency that I'm holding and that I've deposited in some form in a bank. Of course, the irony is, is that there's a certain really high level of trust with current money of all different layers and levels. So, for example, uh, George Mason or uh, the um, Liberty Fund, which runs this podcast, if they want to send me money, they don't – I never see any cash, right, from them. That they We have a, a pretend. We have a little fantasy, a magic game we play where they tell me they're sending me something. It's all electronic. It's all bits. It's all ones and zeros that go into my – bank account. Um, I never see the cash, right? We think of cash, we think of money and payments as green pieces of paper, but increasingly they're not. Uh, there's a fiction involved that we're trading this thing called U.S. dollars. Now, when I take the dollars from a, a pay source, or if you were to accept my dollars, you accept them because you think you're going to be able to spend them. It, 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 that's the mo the most minimal level of trust, right? The counterfeit example gets at that. Right. But if, if no one took dollars... You'd be a fool to accept them as payment. You'd ask for something more reliable or something you thought you could spend. And as you point out, if the government, which runs the dollar show, uh, makes too many of them, then what you can buy with those dollars could change. You could you could still use the dollars, but what it would be able to purchase, it says it might say a hundred dollars. It might be five twenties, but what you can get for five twenties might not be so stable. So that that's another issue of trust. Now, how did those two issues? If we think of those two, sort of, can I spend it, and is it stable? I am I going to get twenty dollars worth of stuff for my twenty dollar bill, or what I think is twenty dollars worth of stuff? How do those operate under Bitcoin? Um, well, the first issue, uh, can I spend it, um, is tricky right now because the number of people who accept Bitcoins for products or services is fairly small. Now, I should say it's it's growing every day as uh, the system becomes more popular. But, um, you know, getting enough people to trust it, you know, there's, there's, there's all sorts of chicken and egg problems of sure. merchants don't want to accept Bitcoins until lots of people are using them, and people don't want to use Bitcoins until lots of, you know, merchants and other people are, are accepting them. Um, I, I don't think we have a lot of examples of kind of a, a startup currency uh, where you're trying to, trying to bootstrap yeah, especially one that's extra national, meaning outside, you know, national governance. One of the, well, we'll come back to that in a, in a little bit. So, how many people right now do? How many people do you estimate accept Bitcoin? Uh, how many people uh, accept Bitcoin? There are probably one or two hundred different merchants that are accepting Bitcoin for various products and services um, right now. And like I said, that's growing. Um, that's taken off in the last six months or so, just as the uh, I, sh I should probably back up and say that Bitcoin's been going for about two years, um, but it's only been the last six months or so that, that really the software has matured far enough so they can build web services on top of it, and people have started to, to do that and accept Bitcoins in their online shops. So let's say I'm having trouble uh, with my computer, which I always am, of course, and, I, and I'm not very good at fixing it. And so I ask a geeky guy uh, or woman to... To fix my computer, and I say, oh, by the way, I want to pay you in Bitcoin. Um, and they are happy to accept that because, let's say, they have a merchant that they know of that accepts Bitcoin, and that merchant has something that they actually want to buy these days. Right. So how would I how would I do that? How would I could I could I do that transaction now? Could uh, I yeah, you in? can do that transaction now. So um, the the person you're paying will have uh, what's called a uh, will will have a, a Bitcoin address. Let's make it you, Gavin, to make it simple, actually. Go ahead. So, um, yes, I, I would send you my, my, one of my Bitcoin receiving addresses. Okay. You would plug that in. You would copy and paste that into, um, well, if your computer's broken, it wouldn't be your computer. You'd probably use somebody <laughs> go, else's computer, yeah, go to, to, a friend's computer yeah. to, uh, to log on to one of these online wallet services. Um, you, would, you would put my Bitcoin receiving address, the amount you want to pay me, uh, press the send button, and then the Bitcoins will be transferred from your account to my account. And all of that is done magically behind the scenes. Almost instantaneously, presumably, at the speed of an email. It, yes. Yeah, I mean, you see it right away. Um, there's actually some technical details in that it's not completely kind of firmed up and confirmed for anywhere from 10 minutes to an hour. Okay. Um, 
And that's just because of the nature of the, the peer-to-peer network that's handling the transactions. So you tell me that you're happy to fix my um, computer for 50 bitcoins. Is that the name of it, by the way? Is that the plural? Yes, bitcoins. Bitcoins. So I, you, you do 50 bitcoins. We agree on the price, but I don't have any. So what do I do? Do I have to find uh, another geek who's got an urge to learn some economics, and I give him a lecture, and they pay me fifty? That would work. Yeah. Okay. I mean, there there are there are Bitcoin exchanges which will um, exchange dollars for bitcoins or bitcoins for dollars. So I can buy them. So you can buy them. Yep. Using uh, another currency. Uh, What's the exchange rate? Um, right now, the exchange rate is about um, one bitcoin. It costs ninety cents. Okay. So. Now that that's been varying a fair bit. Uh, I think a week or two ago it was actually up above a dollar. And what if I don't want to do that? Uh, those those are two ways. I can earn them by doing a service for somebody who pays me in Bitcoin, same way I could get dollars. Right. Yep. Or I can swap them the same way I can get dollars if I'm French. Uh, yep. I could do that. Is there a third way? Um, there is a third way. You can generate them, or yeah, you how can, do I do I that? Say you can you can try to generate them. Um. So we haven't talked about kind of how bitcoins are generated, but uh, for now at least you can take it. Why don't you start with that? Sure. Well, uh, the way the bitcoin system is designed, um, 50 bitcoins are created approximately every 10 minutes. And so there's an algorithm that everybody is running um, on their computers. um, Who has the software who has the software and are trying to generate bitcoins um where essentially you're in a race to try to be the the first one to solve a cryptographic problem um to generate new bitcoins and if you happen to be lucky enough to win that race then you announce to the network i have created 50 new bitcoins and uh, all of the rest of the network um checks to make sure that you actually did solve the problem correctly and uh, then if you did, you, your new Bitcoins will be accepted into the system, and uh, uh, you'll have 50 brand-new, shiny Bitcoins to spend. So the classic uh, metaphor for increasing the money supply in a central bank operation is a helicopter drop, right? which um, isn't what they actually do. What, you know, what they actually do is they buy uh, assets and put uh, money into the economy that way, but – this is the equivalent, right? So this is the way you are adding bitcoins in a very specific, steady way into the system. Yep, and it's designed the, – the algorithm is actually very clever, and it's, it's designed to be incredibly stable. So uh, right now the rule is 50 bitcoins approximately every 10 minutes, and the entire network of computers adjusts the difficulty of this problem that's being solved such that – across the entire network, no matter how many people are trying to generate Bitcoins, only 50 are created every 10 minutes. So if more people join, uh, you know, more computers are working hard on this race, uh, the finish line gets farther away so that on average it, it still takes 10 minutes for somebody across the network to, uh, to solve the problem and generate the 50 Bitcoins. So you said there's 100 to 200 merchants who accept them. How many people have the software? On their computers to to hold bitcoins to use them. It's a little bit hard to tell. Um, roughly, um, roughly five to ten thousand people. It, last time I checked, which was uh, a month ago, um, that's the number of people actually actively connected to the Bitcoin network. So um, I should say you don't actually have to be actively connected to the Bitcoin network to use Bitcoin. You can use one of these online wallet services, and they'll connect to it for you. Um, so and and it's 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 hard to tell, you know, how many people are using those those online wallet services. Uh, I, I don't have numbers on that, but somewhere in in, in that you know five, ten, maybe as many as fifteen thousand people range. So why why do you want to increase uh, the number, and how do you think? Tell us the origins of Bitcoin, and why the decision was made to have that that steady increase, and is it perpetual? Sure. Um, the origin of Bitcoin is interesting. It was actually uh, created by uh, this mysterious person who calls himself uh, Satoshi Nakamoto. Now, um, I have never met Satoshi Nakamoto. I have never spoken to him on the telephone. Um, I've only communicated with him electronically. 
Um, and I'm pretty sure that Satoshi Nakamoto is actually a pseudonym, that that, that is not his real name. Um, but he's a uh, mysterious, very talented um, computer programmer who kind of figured out how to make it work um, and then did all of the work of actually implementing Bitcoin before he announced it onto a cryptography mailing list and then launched it as an open source project. And so, tell us what open source means for people who aren't familiar with it. Uh, open source just means that the, the source code, the, the actual you know, computer programming language code, is available for anybody to look at, anybody to... Well, in this case, it's available for anybody to take and modify, do whatever you you like with it. So, you know, it's it's completely free and uh, and open. And what stops somebody from, say, altering the rate of growth from fifty bitcoins in ten minutes to seventy-five? Well, if if somebody tried to do that, um, then everybody else would would check their uh, check their bitcoins and see that the you know. The rate that they're creating them doesn't match what everybody else agrees should be the rate, and they would just reject their Bitcoins. They wouldn't be accepted. So and nothing stops you from taking the Bitcoin software and creating your own version of, of the system that has different rules. But um, that's actually very easy technically. The hard part is to get anybody else to actually use your new currency. I mean, why okay. would... Why would they want to use your currency that has no merchants, has no infrastructure built up around it? So the <clears throat> so when you say the, it's open source, it's not open source to alter for the syst- the current system of Bitcoin. That's stuck in place. That is stuck in place. I mean, uh, and I, I should say, you know, we do we do alter it. We do fix bugs. Uh, we do talk about um, you know changing kind of on the margins the way the system works. Um, to you know, prevent security breaches or you know uh, other things. I mean, the, the the you asked why 50 bitcoins. You know, why was it designed yeah. that way? Um, you know, those kinds of core rules um, are pretty set in stone. I mean, it would it would require everybody running the software, or well, actually, I should say, a majority of people running the software to agree. Yeah, we think 50 bitcoins is not the right amount. Let's generate 100 every time, 100 every four minutes instead of 50 every 10 minutes or whatever. Um, you'd have to convince the majority of people running the Bitcoin software that that was a good idea and then convince them to download and run a, a new version of Bitcoin. So when you say <clears throat> we, we, we do alter it, we worry about security breaches, we check for bugs, we improve it, who's we? Um, Bitcoin is actually a pretty loosely organized open source project. So it's uh, anybody who's kind of interested in working on it, and and this is how I got involved. I actually um, found out about Bitcoin last May, um, started looking into it, got convinced that it would work, and uh, started just writing code and submitting patches for it. Um, And now, six months later, I'm the de facto kind of leader of the technical project. Um, So there is no official Bitcoin organization. It is just an open source project with a website, bitcoin.org, and anybody who is interested in working on it can come in and work on it. And you know, the, the, you know, the, 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 the better your code, the more likely it is to get accepted by all the rest of the people running the Bitcoin so- software, and uh, the more likely it is for um, those of us who have access to the official version of the software to you know, approve your changes and allow them in. So for those of us who aren't geeks, help us understand how that open source approval works. Um, so, for example, let's suppose somebody sees a way, <clears throat> one of the users sees a way to make the system work faster. Yep. And they propose a change in the code. Um, but they sneak in a little thing that funnels Bitcoins to themselves. <laughs> right? So those of us who aren't – I know you're laughing because it's a stupid question, but – or maybe you think it's a great idea. Oh, no, it's not a stupid no, question. So, That's- so what – what what stops that from happening? Um, well, the process is, um, you know, on the Bitcoin.org website, there are uh, forums where we talk about potential changes. Um, there's a, a source code repository where all of the source code lives. Um, anytime any change is made to the source code, you know, everybody sees it. Everybody sees that a change was made. You can very easily see what the changes were. 
So in, in, in your case, if there was some funky code that was checked into the source tree that made Bitcoins go someplace else, you know, there are going to be at least 10 or 15 people, you know, looking at every change and wondering, what, what is this line of code about right here? Um, so there actually is quite a lot of scrutiny of, of every change that, that goes into Bitcoin. Um, and it's, yeah, it's community consensus as to which changes are accepted and which changes aren't. So when you say consensus, is it a, is it a literal vote? Um, sometimes there are literal votes. Um, like right now, we are talking about whether or not we should enable universal plug-and-play, which is a way of opening up ports in your firewall. Um, and there is actually a, a thread in the message forums with a, with a vote on you know, whether it should be opened up or not, um, with lots of discussion and argument both ways. And uh, it looks like we are not going to because that's the consensus. And you said that's one way. What other ways are there for making decisions about what to add or not to the code? Um, well, there, there are. If there are uh, kind of you know critical uh, high risk security things um, on, on those kinds of things, then like for example, Satoshi and I might just unilaterally decide you know this is an important enough fix that we just need to do it, um, no discussion, and so we will be benevolent dictators. And, uh, and what's make the those check? Kinds of changes. And what's the check on your benevolence? Well, the check on my benevolence is that again, everybody can see the code that changed. Um, people could simply refuse to download the new version of the software. And if if not everybody downloads and runs the new software, then the change doesn't happen okay. because it's you know what act what people are actually running defines the rules. And for those out there listening, thinking, well, this is just some weird, goofy thing. I, you know, he says that it's checked and. What if a group of 10 people kind of get together? You know, there's all kinds of things that we would worry about, those of us who aren't skilled and knowledgeable in open source projects, right? So right. For, for for the people who are used to that, they'd say, well, that's silly. They don't have to worry about that. Right. <laughs> but, but for those of us on the outside, it's like, well, wait a minute. I'm going to put my salary in there. I, uh, you know, I'm going to need to know a lot. But, of course, we do this all the time with our regular bank. We assume they're not going to run away with the money. Oh, but there's laws. And we, we're, you know, there's a whole set of implicit things that and some explicit a lot of them are implicit that that keep us comfortable and and you know as we started off with this conversation one of the things that the government does to us when we use their currency is they can inflate it inflate the amount and deflate the value um so here we're worrying about the possibility and you're saying well it just can't really happen without it would just be extremely unlikely uh and your assurance you know, to a normal person is not not that assuring. It's somewhat assuring um, because we're not really familiar with this. So we'd probably have to go for a while. We'd have to have friends who used it. Is that what you think will happen if it's successful? I think that is what will happen. Well, I mean, the other thing that will happen, and actually the, the thing that is happening now is we will get multiple compatible implementations. So you don't have to trust that Satoshi and I are not going to let anything evil into you know the version of Bitcoin that you download. There will also be a version from, and actually just recently, a, a, an employee at Google has created a compatible implementation of Bitcoin that uh, that he's been working on and that Google has approved, um, and is also being released as open source. So you know I, I think you'll also see kind of branded versions and using branding to get some of that trust. So you may not trust this, this wacky little open source project, but maybe if you know, it has the Google brand name on it, uh, that might help a lot of people. I think it would. Trust that it... it I'm not sure it should, but I think it would. <laughs> <laughs> we know they don't do evil, um, so we don't have to worry <laughs> about that. Um, so we got sidetracked. Why 50 every 10 minutes? And is that forever? That's a good question. Um, or is that a decision we'll make, as is whatever that means? But well, the rules the as they are currently users. designed, um, and as I imagine that they will remain, uh, we can are uh, fifty every ten minutes for the first four years, um, and then the amount generated is cut in half um, every subsequent period of four years. So after Bitcoin's been going for four years, you'll no longer get. 50 bitcoins every 10 minutes, you'll get, well, 
25 bitcoins every 10 minutes will be generated, and after another four years, it'll be 12 and a half, and so on and so forth. And it was designed that way because it's designed to mimic uh, natural resources. So it's designed to mimic kind of digging gold out of the ground, where there's a lot, you find a lot at the beginning, but then as you work harder and harder and go farther and farther, there's less and less to find. Interesting. And presumably the exchange rate between bitcoins and dollars would have some relationship to that pace versus dollar creation. Um, it's not clear. Um, I, I mean, remember that the, the – I mean, the, uh, I'm not an economist, <laughs> um, uh, so maybe I should talk to one. But um, – the the really the the value is is supply and demand. Um, the supply is fixed by this generation rate. So yeah, I suppose if the generation rate is cut in half, um, and demand remains constant, or growth in demand remains constant, then uh, you're going to get price increases. Well, no, I think it would go the other way. I think the well, I'll just speculate about this for a minute, and we can. You know, I'm thinking off the top of my head. Sure. We're not an economist. So but I think I think what's happening is there's a growth rate of Bitcoins right now, and it's going to slow over time. Uh, I saw a presentation you did actually on this, uh, which we'll put a link up to, a video presentation. So basically it's rising at a decreasing rate, and eventually it's going to level off at, at some amount. Uh, now, it, that means that way into the future, way meaning not so far, but – 8, 12, 16 years from now, the amount will be relatively stable, which means that if the dollars are not um, – if, if say, the Fed is behaving so that the money supply is growing rapidly and the um, prices of things measured in dollars is going up at a steady and fast rate or maybe a brisk – an increasing rate, that the price of bitcoins would get bitcoins would get increasingly valuable. How many dollars you'd have to give up to get a bitcoin would go up, right? To because there's going to be what's called an arbitrage condition. Basically, if you can buy stuff with bit, this is in a world where bitcoins and dollars are both used fairly va easily. Um, if if there's a if that relationship between bitcoin Excuse me. The arbitrage condition is that bitcoins and dollars have to buy roughly the same amount of stuff. That's purchasing power parity, and and so um, if if it weren't true, you'd swap one for the other and change. You'd want to swap one for the other and change the rate. So what what it suggests is that because the rate of bitcoin creation is going to be slowing over time, that in theory the prices of goods denominated in bitcoins could start to fall, um, and um, uh, now I'm getting. I have to think some more. But th that's no. I think that's that's right. I mean, oh, Bitcoin is kind of designed to become more valuable. Uh, if you think of them in terms of, of dollars, yes, they, they will they will they will buy more dollars over time. So now let's talk about some of the the problems with Bitcoins. The first thing that comes to my mind. It's not a problem, but an issue is taxes. So let's say I spend. Half, I decide to, I'm a I'm a freelancer. Yep. Uh, I spend half my time consulting for a bunch of different firms, and then I have one client I I spend my other half time on. Now let's suppose that half the other half time is let's say it's Google, and I tell Google I don't want to be paid in dollars anymore. I want to get bitcoins, and I'll accept the rate you've been paying me in the past. Uh, translated into bitcoins at the current Bitcoin dollar exchange rate, and um, and I'm willing to do that because I know there are enough merchants who sell stuff I want for at least half of the buy purchases I I make right now. Now, if I do that, um, what are the tax consequences of that? I think it'd be no different from earning a, any other foreign currency. So, if you earned money in euros or or if you did a barter transaction, uh, you know I am I am not an accountant or a uh, tax attorney, but um, you know, I would imagine that the the tax consequences would be the the same. 
I think uh, that's right for Google because Google is really eager to, to comply with the laws of the United States. They have a lot at stake. Um, they don't want to get in trouble. Right. So I can't barter with Google. I can't say to Google, um, I'm going to work half time here and – Instead of just giving me access to the free drinks and snacks that you have, which I don't know what they if they still have those, but the last time I was there it was one of the things they have. Uh, I'd like you to the bikes that you have on campus. I'm going to take one home. In fact, I'd like a car, but don't tell anybody. So you know you can't. Google's not going to do that. They're, that's all going to be taxable. Um, but but if I'm a, a freelance consultant with some friends, uh, people in the in the um, in the com- computing, the tech community, I could see BitSource as a very attra- Bitcoin as an attractive way to avoid taxes. Sure, it's just like cash that way. It is, or barter, which is, which is, um, again, it's it's taxable in theory. It's just really easy to avoid taxes if you take cash or, yeah, cash or barter. Um, so I, I wonder if that's a legal problem. Not a problem. It's just it's actually a feature, not a bug, but. But eventually, the government may want to say something about that. Well, I, yeah, th- there's been a lot of speculation in uh, the Bitcoin community about um, you know, what will government's reaction be to to Bitcoin, and and will it do try to do something about it, and can it do something about it? Um, and those are interesting problems to have. Yeah, well, the taxes is the least interesting, actually. Let's talk about the bigger issue, which is um, the the main reason. One of the reasons, at least, that the dollars are so powerful is that they are the only way you can pay taxes in the United States. Um, and as a result, you're stuck using the government system up to at least some point or you go or you go to jail. You, you can hide. Uh, you could try to evade the system. But if you want to play within the system, you have to use dollars. And in some sense, that gives the dollar its ultimate um, uh, – reliability because I can use it to pay my taxes and stay out of jail. Uh, if everybody started using Bitcoin and the government solved this – the particular tax problem we just talked about, which is evasion of taxes, but no one used dollars for anything else except maybe just to convert Bitcoin to dollars and pay your taxes. Or maybe there's a way to get around taxes. I don't know. It would be an interesting issue as to what the government's ability to – to monitor the Bitcoin system is, um, what I'm really asking in this horrible, long, roundabout way is, what are the prospects for Bitcoin replacing the dollar or any national currency and breaking the monopoly power of the Federal Reserve? Um, I don't see any kind of theoretical barrier to that happen. I mean, all, obviously, there are all sorts of practical barriers, you know, the big, biggest of which is just trust. Um, it's it's hard to imagine that happening. I, I mean, I could imagine it happening in maybe a smaller country that has decided to peg their currency to the dollar. Maybe they decide to, you know, peg their currency to the Bitcoin instead, or maybe they decide to use Bitcoin as their national currency. I could see that happening, certainly before dollars get replaced. Um, but the biggest problem in, in those situations usually is they don't keep their promises. So right. they promise to, to peg it to the Bitcoin or the dollar, and then they break the promise. Um, if I, I'm thinking, I mean, the reason that the project has so much appeal, besides it's cool, right? That's one appeal. It's yep. very cool. It's it's very cool. Even I'm starting to think it's cool. But the the really cool part of it is, wouldn't it be great if we could just run our lives this way? Um, if I knew that over the next four years, Bitcoins were going to be created 50 at a time every 10 minutes, and I came to trust that, um, and then knew that down the road even farther that – even further that um, it would be 25, then 12.5 until basically the, the stock was basically fixed, um, I might like to play in that sand pile rather than the one where I have to trust Ben Bernanke. Now – Ben Bernanke will tell me that, well, we can't have that world because we need monetary policy to do X, Y, and Z. And I would say, yeah, I'll take my chances. Um, I think that is the um, the argument for really getting excited about this project uh, for the non-geek community. 
Yeah, that is. I mean, and that that's part of what really interested me. Um, you know, besides all the all the geeky cryptography and other cool stuff in there, um, is the notion of kind of taking back control of our money, not trusting central bankers or you know some small elite group of people to control it, but you know, do what Milton Friedman says and let a computer control it and just have some very regular, predictable kind of solid base upon which all sorts of interesting interesting things can be built. And is anybody studying it? Um, that's a good question. As far as I know, I haven't seen any um, economists studying it. I would really like to see that. Uh, I think one of the interesting things about Bitcoin is all of the transactions are, are public. They're all announced across this peer-to-peer network, and they're all stored for all time. So there's kind of a wealth of data on you know, kind of what the money flows are. You could actually compute probably velocity of money and all these other kind of abstract economic concepts that are hard to measure in, uh, in the real world. Um, are a lot easier to measure in the Bitcoin world because everything is controlled by this computer in this network. Yeah, I'm. Um, I hope some of my colleagues will will find this of interest. We, you, obviously, you need a staff. You, you need a you need a research department. You need uh, a bunch of research studies done. Uh, but for now, you're not doing that. So there's, it sounds like there's not a lot of infrastructure there. Are you it? Um. Well, me and everybody else who's interested in the project and um, creating tools around it, there's a, there's a very cool website called bitcoinmonitor.com where you can go and you can actually see transactions going across the Bitcoin network as they happen. I mean, you don't know who's paying whom, but you can kind of see patterns of transactions. You can see the blocks being created. Um, you know, there are people who try to monitor the Bitcoin network for people trying to cheat. Um, you know, all of these things are kind of – all that infrastructure is in the process of, of getting created, in addition to all the infrastructure of people creating shopping cart interfaces for websites and people you know, accepting Bitcoin on their websites and people thinking about Bitcoin stock markets and Bitcoin uh, futures markets and you know, all these other things. Um, kind of, uh, another big part of the reason why I'm really excited about Bitcoin is because th- there's such a low barrier to innovation. Um, it's open source. Uh, you know, get it, compile it, write some code around it, start creating transactions. There's, there's very little barrier to entry. So you know, I'm, I'm confident that we're going to see lots of really interesting things happen really quickly. Is there infrastructure that it has to exist, or is it all just sitting on everybody's systems? It's all just sitting on everybody's system. You I mean, don't have a server in your your hometown or in Satoshi's hometown where where all this stuff is being stored, right? No, it is completely distributed at the moment. And, I mean, that, that will begin to change as we scale up. And, you know, I don't, I don't want to oversell Bitcoin. As we scale up, there will be, um, there will be bumps along the way. I'm completely confident of it. Why? Um, what, will, what will be bumpy? Uh, well, the, for example, as, as the volume of transactions come up, you know, right now I can, I can run Bitcoin on my home personal computer and uh, communicate over my DSL line, right. and I get every single Bitcoin transaction that's happening everywhere in the world. You know, as we scale up, that won't be possible anymore. You know, if there are, you know millions of Bitcoin transactions happening every second, that would be a great problem for Bitcoin to have. It means it's very popular. It's starting to be really trusted. But obviously, I won't be able to run it on my own personal computer. Um, you know, it will take kind of dedicated, you know, fleets of computers with high-speed network interfaces and, uh, you know, that, that kind of a big iron uh, uh, to, to actually do all the transaction processing. Um, now, I'm, I'm confident that that will happen and that will evolve, but, you know, all of the people right now who are trying to generate Bitcoins on their own, own computers and who like the fact that they can kind of be a self-contained unit, I think they're, they may, may not be so happy if Bitcoin gets really big and, and they can no longer do that. They have to start to trust somebody who is running one of these uh, you know, bigger data servers. One of the interesting parts about it, think about it as a... Uh 
innovative project, this is true of all open source projects, of course, is that there's the residual claimant, which is a fancy phrase in, a con in economics talk for the person who gets to make the money, um, gets to get to keep the profit, it would be a better yeah. way to say it. So the residual claimant is the person who gets to keep the profit. In, in a startup business, that's usually the owner and the owner's investors. Um, and we know that opportunity to keep the profit and the risk of losing it keeps the owner on alert to keep the product a high quality one of course it can induce fraud and, and bad things too but um competition alongside the residual claimants on interest are usually what forces businesses to serve their customers so in an open source project um satoshi has pride in the project but he doesn't make any money right um well, in, in Satoshi's case, he, he, he might actually end up making a lot of money, huh? um, just purely because of the fact that he was the first person who started generating bitcoins. Well, that's true. Yeah. So it's as if he's the you know, very first gold miner. Um, he's got a good stash to start with. So, yeah, it's, it's assumed that he has you know, a fair number of those bitcoins that were generated in the first year after he quietly announced it and um, started it running. But that's good, right? And it Sure. I mean, he he worked incredibly hard and had a had a really brilliant idea for kind of how to solve the last piece of the puzzle that allowed the whole system to work. But not just that; he has an incentive to keep its value high and not degrade it. So he does. There's a certain. And what what is your stake? Um, if you can talk about it. Sure. There's, um, no, there's no stock. There's no bonuses. There is no stock. There is no bonuses. I mean. Half of my time, oh, uh, half of my time. I try to spend half of my time uh, working on the actual open source project itself, and the other half of my time creating uh, Bitcoin-related startup. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm hoping that my Bitcoin-related startup will be successful. I'm working on the Bitcoin open source project because there's no chance that my startup will be successful if Bitcoin fails. So, but do you receive a salary? I do not receive a salary. No, I've... I've I've done software startups in the past, and uh, you know, my wife's a professor at the university, so I can afford to take a couple of years and try really risky things. So in one dimension, it's a labor of love, right? Yep. Because it's cool and fun. And the other dimension, though, is that it could lead to something profitable for you through these other ventures. Yep, I'm hoping so. And – how many are there like that? Obviously, you're not involved in all of them. So uh, what's the universe of people trying to do? Again, is it five or is it 50? 500? People doing startups or projects or accessories that would enhance Bitcoin. I would guess it's somewhere between five and 50 um, right now. Uh, although I, there are probably quite a few projects that I don't know about, just that they're, they're, they're keeping quiet. You know, There are at least 10 or 15 that I know of. Um, which range all the way from, you know, 20-year-olds um, who know how to program and have some extra time that they, uh, outside of, you know, their college or whatever, just trying out something related to Bitcoins, to people who are very serious about finding, you know, angel capital to build businesses around, uh, around Bitcoins. Um, that would be very cool. So it, 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 it definitely runs the, the, the gamut, and there are lots of, you know, lots of different things happening, lots of innovation. Is there ever the potential for the infrastructure of Bitcoin to be a paying pursuit? So down the road when it's 1,000 times bigger or 100,000 times bigger, could, could Bitcoin have a – I hate to say it – a chair of the Bitcoin Reserve Bank? <laughs> um, Board of Governors? Well, it prob yeah, actually, I've been thinking quite a lot about do we need a more formal Bitcoin organization um, to kind of set standards and, you know, try to ensure that you know, all the products are interoperable with each other and, uh, you know, just get more formal, maybe get some, get some salary for people whose job it is to... Um, monitor the health of the Bitcoin network and maybe make recommendations on how to change software so that it's, uh, it, it works better or faster. Um, and uh, I don't, I'm, I'm not sure it's necessary yet, although it might be necessary soon. 
I guess I guess one of the issues is my first thought is don't. <laughs> <laughs> but, right, that's probably your first thought. Yeah, your that is. Well, second thought is maybe, but uh, obviously, you know, boards and committees and advisory groups can make lots of trouble. They can. I mean, I was involved in um, uh, in the International Standards Organization standardization process for uh, 3D graphics technology. Um, back when I was working in Silicon Valley. And uh, that project never really went anywhere. Um, you know, we spent a lot of time talking about what the standard should be and going through a whole rigorous process and making sure all our I's were dotted and T's were crossed. And the end result was something that people turned out didn't really want. So, you know, that's, that's a lesson for me that you don't do too much upfront planning. You know, kind of let things evolve organically and it'll it might turn out all right and you'll avoid some of those problems that people have when they get control of something right so well that's the first thought i so i agree with you that's the first thought so the second thought is maybe you do need something and the third thought might be well of course you're going to need something because the code's going to get really big and it's going to take people a really long time to go through it and after all it's not a labor of love it's just labor and you got to pay people etc cetera, etc cetera. so as as scale grows, is that what could is that a natural process? The compl- is the complexity of the code going to have to get more complex? Does it have to get more complex and bigger, or does it do other things have to be added that might avoid that? It doesn't have to. I mean, the the core system. There's actually a lot of pressure to keep the core system as simple as possible, um, and allow kind of non core projects to grow up around it um, that build on top of just the, the, the core features. Um, so I, I don't think it's inevitable that the, you know, the core system will get big and crusty and unwieldy, uh, especially since as we're already seeing you know, alternative implementations of the core system. So there won't be just one, you know, this is implementation of Bitcoin, there will be, you know, many to choose from, maybe some of which will be optimized for, you know, very high volume uh, transaction websites and some of which will be optimized for trying to generate Bitcoins as efficiently as possible and others might be optimized for, you know, running on your computer at home so that, um, you know, you have a really pretty user interface. Let's talk about fraud for a minute. So one of the reasons, if I want to buy something on the internet now, um, there's a whole bunch of different ways to do it, right? There's there's PayPal, yep. there, which is a virtual wallet of sorts, right? Um, yep. There's a credit card. And you know, the problem with the credit card is that somebody's got to pay a fee usually to use it. And the reason they have to pay a fee is that some people don't pay their credit card bills. Um, and there's a big infrastructure of cost around – the process of verifying transactions, pre- preventing fraud. Uh, would Bitcoin save some of those resources? It should, theoretically. Um, and Bitcoin transactions are non-refundable. So once I send Bitcoins to you, I can't... I mean, there is no credit card company to call back and, and say, somebody stole my Bitcoin account and made this transaction, please reverse it. Um, you know, once... Once the Bitcoin transaction goes out on the network, it, it's on the network, and, and transaction, all transactions are final. Um, I think there is still uh, a place for companies like PayPal, uh, which give you some protection against um, maybe your Bitcoin account getting stolen. Um, it'll be interesting to see kind of how that infrastructure builds up. Um, it's, it's, I, th- I think we're building on top of a, a potentially much more efficient kind of basic infrastructure. Um, and I think you'll see a lot of the existing services. Like I could imagine PayPal allowing you to store Bitcoins in your PayPal wallet, just like sure. today you can store dollars and euros in your PayPal wallet and it'll keep them separately. Um, there's no reason they couldn't have you know, a Bitcoin section in your wallet. Um, And then PayPal takes care of keeping those coins safe. And if you have a fraudulent 
PayPal Bitcoin transaction, they'll refund your money and you know, they'll charge you a fee for doing all of those uh, kinds of services. But right now, well, let me ask a more basic question. Um, can you, Gavin, give me 10 Bitcoins if you feel like it? Sure. You just need to send me your a Bitcoin receiving address and, and right. So right this, over. So when you say they're they're non-refundable, they can be reversed. It just can't it can't be reversed by you, the the initial decision maker. So right. if you give me the ten coins, say, oh, I was just kidding, it was just a joke. You can't reclaim them. Right, I can't reclaim them. I would have to beg you to right. send them back to me, and I'd give them back in a second. Don't worry. <laughs> um, but the same thing would be true of merchants. So if a merchant said, I had a fourteen day uh, trial with the goods and I didn't like them and I wanted my money back, they can choose to give me back my Bitcoins. Uh, if they don't, it's fraud. They violate the terms of their – I can take them to court. And right. of course the issue is always the cost of doing that is very high for any one transaction. So what PayPal is doing, I guess, is is eating those losses um, so that I can have – as the as any one buyer, I can I can transact fearlessly. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. I mean, they, they essentially spread those losses over all of their merchants and all of those cost customers. Um, I mean, essentially, and then they pursue. They have, they have the law department that pursues cheaters, which I don't want to have. Right. Yeah. So that makes sense. Um, so, what threatens the future of Bitcoin? Um. Uh, that's. A, I mean, what holds it back? We've talked about some of those things, right? What threatens it? Um. Uh, what threatens Bitcoin? Um, it's it's mostly it is really a question of 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 trust and usability, um, which I think you know, I'm I'm pretty confident at this point that uh, that it will it will find a niche. Um, I am not confident that it will replace the dollar, but I am pretty confident that there will be you know several niches where it turns out Bitcoin is a, a really useful um, internet pay payment mechanism. I'm, I'm not sure what those niches are going to be. Um, but the, the, I think the thing that really holds it back from replacing the dollar or PayPal or the, you know, these other payment mechanisms we have is those other payment mechanisms have a huge head start. Uh, they're already pretty well trusted. And there's just a lot of infrastructure already built up the existing kind of payment systems and currencies. And I think Bitcoin's going to have a, a hard time. Well, I don't know. It remains to be seen whether Bitcoin has a, has a hard time overcoming um, those barriers. You know, it could have some real advantages, though, which would help, which is that rate of growth. Yeah, it does. And, and I mean, some of the incentives built into the system – are certainly helping in this kind of bootstrapping phase. Um, so, for example, um, you know, Bitcoin appeals to you know crypto hackers, and uh, it, it it appeals to you know um, it, it it appeals to the hardcore geek crowd, and a lot of the hardcore geek crowd want to see it succeed. Um, and so we're not seeing a lot of attacks on Bitcoin. We are seeing people who might see an attack on this possible on Bitcoin and will let us know, you know, is, is this going to be a problem? Maybe you should fix it this way. So I think there's a lot of incentive for people who are, you know, kind of early adopters to, to help make the system stronger. Um, I mean, the question is, um, could the government take my Bitcoins Without my consent. Well, if they can take your computer, you know, physically take your computer that holds your Bitcoin wallet, and you haven't bothered to encrypt it with a, a password that only you know, then uh, they can do it that way. Um, but short of that, as far as cryptographers know, there's kind of no way for them to to get your Bitcoins. I mean, that's the coolest thing about this to me, is that it's... Um it really tests your feeling about the word virtual, right? It's right. It's as a real a virtual currency as you can imagine. It's very. It's a very cool thing. Um, and let's close with talking about what could make Bitcoin take the next leap. So, of course, being on Econ Talk will be looked back by historians as one of the key turning points in the acceptability of the currency. But in case that isn't true. 
Um, so publicity is nice, right? It's nice to get a feature in the New York Times Sunday Magazine. That would be nice. I'm, I'm hoping it doesn't happen tomorrow because I don't think the Bitcoin is quite ready for it. It's still very much kind of a tool for geeks and not a tool for everybody. So what would what can you imagine? Since you're the since there's no marketing department, you don't have government affairs, um, you don't have a PR department. Right. Um, you're it. If there is any of those things, it's you, or it's all of us. You know, I guess it's an interesting question. Um, what might help Bitcoin get to the next level? What event or do you see a path? Um, I do see a path. I mean, I, 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 I see, you know, kind of this, this kind of grassroots adoption of, you know, early adopters deciding Bitcoin is cool and they're just going to start using it. Um, I think you'll see it more and more pop up on, on websites as, you know, yet another payment button. Um, we need to do some things to make that easier technically for merchants to do. Um, I could imagine in you know, not too long, a year or two, uh, PayPal or some other major payment processor, maybe Google Payments, who knows, you know, one of these big either PayPal or PayPal competitors deciding that Bitcoin will be one of the currencies that you can, you can store with them and they will provide the service of exchanging other currencies to and from Bitcoin. I think that would, be, that would uh, hugely ex- uh, help acceptance. Um, and then there are, there are all sorts of, um, there's a grassroots project happening in New York City right now where they're trying to get um, Bitcoins accepted at uh, cash registers where you do the little rendezvous with your cell phone and you can be standing there at the cash, cash register um, and pay with Bitcoins. So, you know, something like that, uh, I think... Um, they make it really take off. Yeah, that'd be very cool. My guest today has been Gavin Andreessen. Gavin, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Great to talk to you, Russ. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.